Our very own respect you here in the 4 7. Woo! He's the best respected, by the way, than um, uh, of anybody in the city. No, we're just friends like that, right? <laughs> so, we're, um, Commissioner, did you want to share? Yeah, yeah, I do want to share. And uh, you know, it's okay that you say he's the, the best uh, precinct commander. That's fine because he's yours. I think okay. they used to say that. <laughs> and I think they used to say that about me in the fourth floor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as he said a number of times, he's been here two years and eight months, and I'm sure he's enjoying every every minute of it. But when understand that when Ruel first got to the 4-7, there were some uh, huge challenges as far as uh, violence, uh, shootings, mm -hmm. and homicides. And Ruel came from the 3-0, which is in Manhattan. He came here. Uh, he he managed to deal with that issue directly. Uh, he's doing a great job in the 4-7. And I will say that uh, uh, Ruel is one of the top precinct commanders in the city. Yeah. So Ruel, yeah. that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's got nice hair. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
the number we ended 2016 was doubled, almost over doubled, um, the number of shooting and shooting, vic shooting incident and shooting victims. You know, so some of the ways that we're um, we're combating the issues that we're we're seeing here in the 47. Again, it's the partnership, starting with um, last. Uh, two years ago when we first met here, um, our commissioner was the uh, chief of department then, I believe. Um, Pastor Q uh, presented um, a, she pr proposed um, a, a program called People's Police Academy where the officers can see the community through the lens of the people. Um, so it was a two-day course where I selected 50, three days, where I selected, yes, three days, uh, where I selected 50 officers, and they, the community members introduced the community. Even if these officers were here for a number of years, uh, they got something out of it. There were things that they, they learned that they would not have gotten, you know, through just police in the streets. So that was a very eye-opening and very positive experience. And it is because this department recognized the importance in, in having officers get to know the community that they police and get to know the, the, uh, the people better. There's also a program called Project 180 that we launched with Pastor Q, where individuals between 16 and 21 or 24, we play with the age, when they're arrested for violations um, and, and uh, nonviolent misdemeanors, it's sort of like a diversion uh, what do we do with those people? We don't unnecessarily criminalize, so we refer to Pastor Q and her people in Project 180, and she has a success story to tell you about 10 of those individuals that we refer to her. They're doing well in school, no interaction with the law, enfor law enforcement, and they're staying out of trouble. So those are some success that we've seen in a program like that. So it's not necessarily locking people up because you don't necessarily solve a whole lot by just putting people through the system. We also started um, two years, uh, three years now, uh, Shoot Hoops Not Youth, where officers partner up uh, with local crew members and we play basketball. 4-7 um, precinct team did not do too well, but the <laughs> overall goal was accomplished. And that is officers, again, interacting in a different type of encounter with local neighborhood children. And uh, that program has kicked off well, and we've done very well. Call to Duty um, is a program where officers, I selected, again, mentor youth within the community, where we see young men and women who are now sitting with officers, uh, gaining experience and knowledge from them, and hopefully we encourage those young men and women to become officers and to also hear and listen to what they have to say. Oftentimes we implement uh, different programs that affect these young men and women, but we don't include them at the table when we sit down and put these programs together. So we hear what they have to say and we utilize those, uh, that information and help them. Um, we have several back to school events that we do where we give book bags and school supplies to youth, over 5,000 youth. Um, at the 47 precinct, again, a program that we've developed with our neighborhood uh, people. The Police Foundation and other organizations uh, are sponsors, but again, our clergy, our local businesses. Uh, we open the doors for, of the 47 precinct to young men and women who walk in and they encounter, their encounter with the police is a very good one. They see the precinct as a place in the neighborhood where they have a positive um, a positive encounter. Um, those families that we find are families that our uh, NCOs recommend from their rounds and getting to know people. They meet people in the neighborhood. They interact with them. They see, they, they visit them at home or at school. And they know that these are families that are needy. So those families' uh, information are kept in a database when we have our toy drive, which we've, we've done three years in a row. And the toy drive, again, uh, I'll never forget this story with this mom who had just moved to New York, a uh, 10-year-old son. Again, um, times were very hard, um, and she had just told her son that he was not gonna have a gift for Christmas. Now, it's beyond giving a gift that year, uh, because I've always felt like a mother who loves her child 
who could not provide for that child, what would she do um, to see to it that that kid got a gift? Steal, prostitution, you name it. So that year we were able to provide for, uh, for you know, her and her, uh, her family. This year, I was stopped after we did our toy drive by a detective in a 4-7 squad. And she came up to me and congratulated me and said, wow, Inspector, thank you for what you're doing. She goes, you know, when I was, when I was growing up, my mom and, and dad uh, did not provide a gift. I never got a Christmas gift during the holiday season. So there are many stories like that of the people who were touching, the people who are interacting with our NCOs and our cops. They're seeing officers as human and not just enforcers. A turkey drive and our senior dinner. I can go on and on about all these programs that we've done and what we've accomplished. But overall, these are just long-term relationship building and we could not do it if we were not connected with the community. And our neighborhood policing model is that model that allows us to see you as one. And so Pastor Q, yourself, Reverend Pryor, and everyone here, uh, you ask what can you do continue to do this because it is working. You see it in the numbers, you see it in the relationship that we have, uh, that we're creating, and you see it in how we are policing. We're taking guns off the street and we're not having the incidents that you've seen in the past. And so it is because of the trust, it is because of the training that our officers have while we're able to accomplish that. So I just wanna thank you for giving us this platform to be able to tell you what we're doing. But I'm also equally thankful that you are here and that you want to partner. We have the best community in the entire city. When I first got here, yes, Chief Gomez, he wouldn't say it now because he is in charge of the entire city, but he told me, he said, the Bronx is the best place in the city. So I want to thank you and uh, have a good day. Thank you, Inspector. Yes, sir. Just to, well, just to let you know, when he goes to Brooklyn, he says the same thing. <laughs> also, um, we know we have representative from the mayor's office. I also want to recognize our local councilman that's with us today, Andy King. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to go into a few more questions and I'm going to ask other representatives from the um, New York City Clergy Roundtable come and they have some specific questions as well. How many New York City arrests involve parents whose children are present at the arrest and does NYPD have a protocol in place to safeguard these children minimizing the trauma and aftermath of seeing their parent arrested? Mm. Yes, there, uh, there is a protocol, however, we don't track those, uh, those incidents, but certainly um, we, uh, we ask the parent or, or guardian if there are uncared for children in the, uh, in the household, and if there are, we make every attempt possible, and I really mean every attempt possible, to get a, uh, a relative or another adult designated by the, uh, by the parent to take that child. Bringing that child to ACS is certainly our last, uh, our last resort, and I want to say that that's the, that's the last thing we want to do. We want to get another relative there designated by the parent to care for the, uh, for the children. And, and now what we're telling our officers to minimize the trauma when, when, there's, when there's an arrest and children are present. And what does that mean? If, if at all possible, um, do not let the, the children witness the handcuffing of, of a parent. That's when possible and, and, and feasible. When, when you leave the, uh, the residence, don't utilize the, the sirens or, or the lights. Minimal trauma to, to, the, uh, to the child if one of his parents is, is, is to get arrested. Um, traffic deaths, speeding. Someone wanted to know how do these cameras work? How do the cameras work? <laughs> the, uh, these, 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 <laughs> there are speeding cameras uh, throughout the city. Some of them are mobile, the, the, the ones around the, uh, uh, the schools. Uh, you know, they certainly play a big part in our Vision Zero uh, mission, uh, which, you know, and this year we're getting off to a, uh, a challenging start, I, I, I may add. But it's not just uh, the speeding cameras, it's about enforcement by the, uh, 
by the offices, by the, by the highway offices, and that is done uh, throughout the precincts, throughout the borough. Chief uh, Tommy Chan, the Chief of uh, Transportation, who, 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 who works for me, chairs uh, weekly meetings, traffic set meetings, and, and we see where these uh, locations are where people tend to, uh, to speed, and it's just like uh, pinpoint policing. We, we kind of know where it's happening, where the accidents, where the injuries, where the deaths occur. And we come up with strategies to uh, to address them, and then many times that in, that involves putting uh, resources, police officers, along those roadways and, and those locations to, to conduct uh, enforcement. And so it's not just the uh, the cameras, but certainly cameras do help if you if you're aware where these cameras are. Uh, you know, you really. I think they wanted to turn like, all their tickets in. I think. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're, we're kidding. Um, <laughs> And then we have two more questions, and I'm going to um, turn it over. Uh, and this is, uh, what, what are your plans of stop and frisk policy since Obama is leaving the White House? Okay. All right, back on again. So stop, stop and frisk is a uh, constitutionally tested tool that police officers use all, all over the United States. It's actually called, uh, it's from a Supreme Court case, Terry versus Ohio. Uh, it's a tool that uh, the New York City Police Department uh, has to continue to, to, to use. And I, I don't want to get too technical, but if uh, I'm a police officer and I'm going to utilize stop and question, there are very le various levels of, of suspicion. Uh, and you need, the, it's called reasonable suspicion. Uh, in, in order to do that, you have to be able to articulate that. If the person that uh, you are stopping has committed a crime, uh, is committing a crime, or had, is just about to commit a crime. And this, 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 it's constitutionally tested. So we went from 2011, from 600,000 stops, and last year we had about 13,000 uh, 13, stops. And with that decrease, you still see a, uh, a huge decrease in shootings, a uh, decrease in crime, and a decrease in homicides. So it's a tool that we have to continue to use, but we have to make sure that it's used fairly and effectively. I think the reduction in numbers is great. Um, the, so what they're asking really is with Trump coming in and appointing his own person, will that affect us here in New York City? It, it will have uh, no effect on how we utilize the uh, tool of stop and question. Okay. Um, and, uh, my last question before I get the others up is with the newly elected president residing in New York City, how will the police department regarding manpower be affected? Because there's been a lot. Um, it is... Uh, 57th and 5th is probably one of the busiest, if not busiest, intersection in New York City. It is a uh, challenge for us. It's also a challenge for the United States Secret Service. We are using uh, uh, hundreds of police officers there every day on a 24-hour basis. It is costing the police department, uh, obviously the city, uh, a tremendous amount of money each day. Uh, we're looking for reimbursement from, from the federal government. Uh, because we cannot, we cannot just uh, assign people to that area, uh, just utilizing the people from Manhattan South. We are taking uh, resources from throughout the city, trying to minimize the impact on each on each patrol borough. But it does have an effect on us, and uh, I, I think moving forward, we will be able to get reimbursement and make sure that we'll continue to keep people safe throughout the city and at uh, 56th and 5th. The Secret Service obviously is charged with the protection of the president-elect and the soon-to-be president. But we, as the NYPD, have to make sure that uh, there's a lot of people in that area, a lot of vehicular traffic, a lot of buildings that we have to keep people safe there, too. So that's part of our obligation. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So at this time, I want to call up um, one of our members of our clergy roundtable, Reverend Ruben Austria. Um, he has a set of questions, followed by Rabbi Bob Kaplan, who will be addressing some issues for the religious community. Can we hear Reverend Ruben Austria? Amazing. Executive Director of... Community Connections for Youth is changing our city and ultimately the world as we know it. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, thank you, Pastor Q. Um, uh, thank you to the uh, leadership of the NYPD for being here. As Pastor Q said, um, I'm the founder and executive director of an organization called Community Connections for Youth, uh, which works to empower grassroots faith and neighborhood organizations to develop uh, what we call effective community-driven alternatives to incarceration. Uh, things like Project 180 right here, uh, the type of initiatives that come from the community. Um, I have uh, four questions that have been submitted by uh, people in the audience, and the first one is, violence in schools is of great concern. What are some of the things that are in place to address violence in schools and that will be in place in the future? So, I always... 
I oversee um, all the school safety agents. There are about 5,000 school safety agents. And we also have a uniform task force in the uh, school safety division in the New York City Police Department. Um, obviously, the safety and security is our responsibility in all the schools. We have about 1.1, it's either 1.1 or 1.4 million uh, kids that go to schools throughout the city. Um, tremendous challenges. Uh, in the city school system. We have been extremely successful. We've seen decreases in crime over like 35% in five years in the seven major crimes reported in the city. And in addition, we've seen like a 60% decrease in arrests in schools. We have worked tremendously closely and in a collaborative fashion with Department of Education with our partners in schools. We have a lot of programs that are addressing youth-related issues in schools. We do presentations on bullying and drugs and different things like that. We've created explorer posts in schools. That's different. We hadn't done that in the, in, in the past. So schools can now have a school safety agent or a uniformed police officer be a post advisor for explorers specifically. We do a tremendous amount of training. Uh, our school safety agents now get all different training that they used to. They used to have 15 weeks of training, now they have 17 weeks. So they get training in conflict resolution and, and de-escalation policies. Um, obviously with the advent of social media, that is our concern because what goes on at home has obviously, and over the web, has ramifications because one kid will say something and then something else will happen as a result. And so we stay on top of that and deploy our resources and work closely with the borough commanders who have people in their patrol boroughs that are in charge of all the schools within their patrol boroughs. So we stay on top of what's going on to be both pre proactive and reactive. Thank you, and I'm sure you guys know Joshua Laub from the New York City Department of Education, Office of Safety and Youth Development. Uh, has really been a driving force in uh, restoring school climates and the partnerships between law enforcement and school that is reducing arrests while still treating students with dignity. Wow. Uh, the second question that I have uh, from the audience is, um, we've seen a relaxation in marijuana arrests, uh, but what are the plans in place to address the sale of marijuana to young people in various neighborhoods by people who live in the same community? Lay here, so there we go. I'm going to start off, and then uh, Terry Monahan and Chief uh, Gomez can jump in. Uh, there is um, there was a change in policy where if uh, it's mere possession of marijuana, you would get a summons, but if uh, you smoke marijuana in public, it's still a, uh, a misdemeanor uh, within the penal law. So that that hasn't changed. So we're we're really looking at uh, the question is specific to the sale of marijuana, and we do still have. Uh, in the precincts, we have the NCOs and sector cops responsible for conditions that exist in their sectors. But we also have, uh, we changed the way we do business within the, de the Detective Bureau. We used to have what was called the Organized Crime Control Bureau. Uh, we put that under Chief Boyce, who's the Chief of Detectives. Uh, so all the narcotics, gang, and, uh, and vice are now under Bob Boyce. And it's still a part of our strategy because we did have, uh, we have in the past, and we continue to have uh, issues and, and, and challenges and problems with uh, around violence and, and the sale of marijuana. So, uh, Terry, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the cases that we're doing. Not specific to what the cases are, but kind of an overview of how we're doing. Again, just to talk specifically about your question, man, this is that cooperation and getting to know your, your, your area and your beach. It's having our uh, NCOs, having a relationship with the schools. It's not every school that has these issues, but when there is an issue, we have to let them know. There has to be a coordination. Let us know where the areas are. It's the parents coming to the school and the PTA. They know where it is. It's the principals knowing it and getting that information to our cops. Creating that relationship so that we can now target who the individuals are that are selling. As the commissioner mentioned, we're doing a lot of casework now. And when we do casework, we're looking to get the main guys. We're looking to get the guys that are really causing the problems within the area. We want to identify them, and we want to put really strong prosecutorial cases on them, where we actually put them away. And uh, if this isn't, uh, in the past, we may have gone to an area and swept up a whole lot of people, incarcerated, and they're back out. That's not what this casework is. As we mentioned before, 100 case takedowns this year. 
These are cases that are put together in cooperation with our detectives, uh, the narcotics people, and we're looking for the worst of the worst. And we're looking to build cases on the guys that done the violence in the neighborhood. We're doing the dealing in the neighborhood. And prior to taking one of these cases down, it's all presented to a grand jury. So that it's not us just going in and grabbing people on the streets. The people we've grabbed are already indicted, pre-indicted before we lock them up. So these are the people that we've had gathered more than enough evidence on, on and that the cases are going to be strong. And after we take down one of these cases, the first thing that we're starting to do now is come right back out to the community the next day. Just, uh, I have my uh, counsel here, Edna Wells Handy, and uh, Edna is a huge contributor to, to the way we uh, run our department. And a suggestion that she had that each and every time that we have a, a major crew gang narco takedown, that we actually uh, go out and have a community debriefing, have a meeting with the community, explain uh, what she just had transpired and, and what it means to, uh, to the people in the community. So, uh, so it's uh, a level of transparency. So, Edna? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And thank you for attributing that to me, but in many ways it goes to Councilman King because um, what we've done is once there's a takedown, we've instituted a five-step program that brings to bear all of the resources that uh, we have in relation to uh, what was done, who did what, when, where, and how, and we bring that information to the community. One of the first ones of those community debriefs were, was had here, and that was with Councilman King and others in the community. And leveraging what was learned from that, we started the program now with uh, under Chief Monahan and Chief Harrison, really looking at first, what were the conditions, making sure that we respond and that you understand the reasons why we're responding to the conditions through first notification, second, a community debrief, where we come, the entire law enforcement team is made available to answer questions, the who, what, when, where, how, and why of the takedown. But we also recognize that we can keep taking down, but if we don't stem the pathway, then we'll keep taking down. And so two other aspects of the uh, post-takedown community strategy, are looking at first, who's next in line? And what can we do to either minimize the threat by removing it from the community or redirecting the energies that might result in that threat? And under Chief Harrison, that's a very um, poignant piece to what we're doing because it will then bring in the community partners that we have. We're working with Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, we're working with the Citizens Crime Commission. So it's a real holistic response to a very important uh, policing model, but really now, as you're hearing so much about talking about the shared responsibility, but really looking at how do we all have access to the information, how do we all provide the kind of direction that is needed so that when we do have the takedown, we look at it as a, a possibility, a probability, a likelihood, and an opportunity for real change in the community. Thank you, and I think you've answered in a lot of ways the next question, but I'm going to ask it again just so you know how important this is to the community because it's something that I've heard over and over again. Uh, which is the question of what alternatives and measures do you anticipate putting in place to help our at-risk youth from ending up in prison? And one of the things we're aware of in the community that with the takedowns, some of the distress that we feel is when we see that the first level of takedowns is people in their 30s and 40s, and the next one is their 20s, and then you get some people who are 16, 17, who've been part of a two or three year investigation, and we say, could not have something been done different to reach these young people at the age of 12, 13, 14, so they don't wind up in the takedown. And I know that that's on the heart of people in this room. So again, if you could speak to that, how not just after the takedown, but before the takedown, are we redirecting the young people who are at risk of being involved in that takedown when they're in those impressionable teenage years? So thank you for asking that question, because to me there's nothing more critical and important than what you just said, because we all have a responsibility and obligation to help raise our kids. And every kid, we can't control risking kids' lives, we cannot control the risk, 
but we can tr control as adults hope in kids' lives, and that's what we're responsible to do. And so what we do, we want to get those kids early. We want to get them in schools early. We want to develop relationships with them. We want to make sure that we become role models and we become people that they could count on if in need. So how do we do this? We now started not just the Explorers, which are the older kids. We have younger kids, they're Explorer Cubs. They're in Explorer Clubs, Junior Explorers. We want to get them when they're 11, 12, and 13. We run a YPA, Youth Police Academy, six weeks of a summer camp. There are a couple of locations, maybe three or four in the Bronx. Summer camp, six weeks free to all young kids. In addition to that, we have a JRIP program. JRIP is Juvenile Robbery Intervention Program. The program works with young people already arrested for robberies to give them an opportunity to change their lives. They've been arrested for robberies. We've done it in Brownsville. We've done it in East Harlem. We're in Astoria, and we're coming to the Bronx. We're coming to the 4-0 and PSA 7. They're working on the building to build space. We got a million dollars from the city council, which shows their dedication and their commitment to help kids that, made a, that might have made one stupid mistake or five stupid mistakes. But where we're giving them an opportunity to change their lives, and we're doing that by providing resources and services to not just them, but to their family. To look at that young kid and say, okay, you're out there doing robberies, we're gonna give you a chance. This is gold, touch gold with us, we're bringing services, we're going to that family, and we're working with them, and we are changing kids' lives. We're helping them get back into school. We're helping them get an education. We're getting them jobs. We get 160 jobs over the summer. We get full-time jobs for these kids. Education, economic, and then we're helping them go to college. We're doing their college applications with them. I can tell you story after story. There's a video of these kids that we have, a five minute video, that they talk about robbing people and why they rob people and how the intervention of a program, of a person, and it's a cop in this, per, in this program, but it could be any other adult. It could be a guidance counselor, a clergy person, a teacher, or a neighbor. Sometimes it takes but one person to touch a young person and to give them that change, that light goes off, that sense from hopelessness and despair to hope and self-esteem and vision to see their future. And we're all responsible to do that. And I think we, the police department, are doing that. Thank you, Chief Jaffe. Uh, I know you're a passion for JRIP and you've been working on that for many years. And so the last question I have um, is actually one that was asked by a young man that I know uh, who is uh, currently, uh, he, he, he came through the New York City Department of Probation uh, being on probation as a high-risk youth offender. Um, uh, he became employed, went through a program called Arches, which brings together formerly incarcerated men and women to mentor young people. And this young man, uh, he raised this question and he said, you know, when I was young, I wanted to be a police officer. He said, and I was in the Explorers, and I joined all these programs, but when I hit a certain age, so once I got to be about 15, 16, I went from being a, a good kid to being a bad kid in the eyes of the officers, right? He said, I was stopped, I was frisked, I was questioned, I was harassed. As a young black man in Bed-Stuy, he said, my experience with the police made me want to do anything but become a police officer. But this young man who after he went down the road and committed some crimes and turned his life around and met some people, he came up with a new idea and he said, you know, I wish, he said, this program called Arches changed my life because it was men and women like me who grew up in the same neighborhoods who were incarcerated. Why couldn't we have an initiative in the police department called Explore Arches, where uh, officers could do things like your NCOs are doing and visit the Arches programs and meet with other young people who are trying to turn their lives around, meet with mentors. It was an idea he raised you know, under the last administration and it didn't really go anywhere. And, and one of the questions, so the question that I want to ask on behalf of this young man, um, and, and I feel compelled just as I'm up here just to, to speak theologically for a second, uh, in honor of my mentor, Dr. Rivera, but Commissioner O'Neill, you, you said that there's some, uh, really some bad people out there, and, and we know that there's some people who do horrible things, 
Uh, but we know in the faith community, we believe in redemption. Right? We believe that Saul of Tarsus uh, was murdering Christians and was called and repented and gave his life to Christ and became the Apostle Paul. We know that Jesus preached the demoniac. We know that there are people in this room who have multiple felonies on their records, people who have rap sheets longer than the piece of paper that's in front of you, who have turned their lives around and are now part of the solution. Uh, but many of these people who are formerly incarcerated, many young people, 16, 17, 18, 19, they're in programs, they're trying to turn their lives around, but because of where they live, because of uh, the, the housing projects they live in, because of their families, they're still marked, often by your agency as bad people. And they're looking for a chance to partner, but they wanna partner in a real way, not, not just to be treated as the problem, because I know that your programs are excellent for those young people who have always been on the straight and narrow, and those community members who've always been in church and have always done, but we have so many young people. They work for me. They, they work in other agencies. They want to work with you for public safety. And so I want to ask, would you consider partnering on a real level with formerly incarcerated men and women, with young people who are turning their lives around uh, to address those critical issues of public safety? Uh, Reverend, let's explore that possibility uh, through Joanne's office. And, and through what person are you in? I'm in the 4 -0. In the 4 -0? Okay, what a better, no better place to start. All right, we have, it's an NCO, it's a Neighborhood Policing Command. I think that have the NCOs come by. Yeah. And J-Rip's going down to the 4 also. And then uh, I believe in redemption too. We all, we all learn from our mistakes and that's how we move forward with life. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank Reverend Q and all the organizers, and particularly Commissioner O'Neill, for bringing this together today. It's extremely important. These are the kinds of things that heals our communities and makes us stronger in being able to work together. Partnerships are unbelievable tools in making the city better for everyone. I know that the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York, for which I work, has had an incredible relationship with just about everyone this, this, uh, this day is here, and, and the entire NYPD and creating real linkages between the work that we need to do and the work that you need to do. There's another community in New York, and certainly nationally as well, because of national debates and national invectives that are going around, the, the Muslim community that is living in some real fear and terror. They're, they're really afraid of what might happen. I know that there was a program in the NYPD, a surveillance program. What is the, uh, the, the program today, what is the NYPD doing today to work effectively with the Muslim community to quell some of those fears and to build better relationships? All right, right now in the uh, NYPD we have uh, over 800 uh, agents that are police officers, so I think that's, that's a huge start. And I think uh, Putting them in, in uh, the right places voluntarily, uh, working with the community, continuing to build trust. Uh, we do have a, a very active uh, intelligence bureau and counterterrorism bureau. And the only way we're going to continue to make people safe is to work together and, and not to be seen as the enemy. We have to do this uh, in conjunction with each other to, to make sure that, as I said when I, when I, when I, uh, when I started, came here before is that we all want to live in peace and I, I think the only way we're going to do that is, is to work together. So uh, it's, we have a couple of fraternal organizations, they do a lot of work. Uh, they do a lot of work off duty actually. They volunteer in their communities and to make sure that we, we repair any damage that was done. I would just, I would like to, I would like to add from, uh, from the Community Affairs Bureau, what we're doing in the city. We have a very, very robust outreach unit. It's led by Inspector Griffith, who's here today. With him is Detective Amen Muhammad, and he's a perfect example of an officer that came into the police department, detective, now is a detective, but works closely with his fellow officers, reaching out to the Muslim community. We know how scared some of um, the, our, our Muslim brothers and sisters are. They are living in fear, not just because of what's going on in the city um, and across this country, but because um, they don't know the language and they don't know, you know exactly 
um, the direction that the country is going in. So they live with a lot of fear, and there's you know vice incidents every once in a while uh, uh, against them. And so we work closely, reaching out to those communities through the imams, through our through our clergy liaisons, like I talked about. Through the mosque, we go visit them. We go into business districts. We have a soccer and cricket league. We have 500 Muslim youth that belong to our soccer and cricket league that works throughout the summer. We play basketball in their schools. We play volleyball in their schools. We have done a lot reaching out to those Muslim communities. They have a direct line to offices in the Community Outreach Immigrant Outreach Unit. So when they um, need information or they want us to come out and do presentations or talk to their children, they have a direct line to us and we can do that. And then we engage and bring the NCOs and the local precincts to get involved with that also. Uh, and I know I've worked with that unit intensely and they've done tremendous amount of work. But let me just build it up just a little bit and build upon that. What are they also doing to build better relationships between the different faith groups in New York? not just one faith group, but all the faith groups in New York, because it's faith leaders that will work, as, as happening here today, most importantly, to build a better city for us all. So I, I actually think that question is so important, and I could answer that, but you might be tired of hearing from me, Inspector Griffith. Stand up and say all the work you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Keith. <laughs> Sure. Actually, Steve, you can come up here and talk yeah. about it. <laughs> <laughs> the inspector and his Thank team, you. we just, we just do Kaplan. amazing stuff together. Really hey, what's up, Bronx? Stuff. I'm from Brooklyn, so. Yeah. Yeah. I represent from Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so, um, I'm Inspector Griffin. I'm in charge of the citywide outreach unit for Chief Jaffe. And one of the units that I have is clergy unit. And I have two officers assigned. And we think, you know what, how are we going to partner up the uh, different sections of the city? And we look at people to partner up with. Who are our stakeholders in our community? And when you think about it, naturally, it's our religious leaders. Because in a city like New York, a city of immigrants, when you first come to the city, where do you go? Where do you feel more comfortable? Wherever you come from this, this big uh, world, you go to your religious institution. And that's the place, first place you go. So if we want to team up and we want to meet New Yorkers, those are the people we need to team up with. Those are our stakeholders. And we've seen that in Pastor Q, we've seen that in a rabbi. You know, these are the people, these are the New Yorkers that we have to reach out to. These are the New Yorkers that really let us know what's going on. They're honest with us, we share information. And those are the people that connect us to the people sometimes we can't reach. You know, New York City, you know, there are populations that it's hard for the police department to reach. And we reach out to our clergy partners, and they help us to take us to those communities that normally we wouldn't be able to go to as uh, police officers. Because sometimes there is some fear of uh, speaking to the police in certain communities because of where they came from and how the police were will, will looked at from the places they came from. So with our partners and clergy, we're able to go out and be able to reach those people. So like the chief said, in every precinct, Every uh, commanding officer gets an opportunity to nominate someone from one of his faith uh, institutions and in his command to be a clergy liaison. And that's a very important title, to be a clergy liaison, you know, because you're really entrusted in working with the police department. You bring the issues that's going on, like I said, in that community, you know, and you help it to bring us. And, you know, and our clergy leaders, you know, they're honest. They let us know when we're, what we're doing that's working, and they let us know when we're not doing the right thing. So we get honest, real information from these leaders. So that's why it's very important that we team up and we listen to these faith leaders. You know, I've been in this unit for going on two years, not got an uh, commissioner, and I've dealt a lot with Pastor Q. And she reaches out to me, you know, she tells me, and I get a phone call, and she's saying, Inspector Griffith, you know, I have this young lady, and I need help. So I reach out to my partner, Jimmy Klein, and I say, this is, you know, we have to help uh, pass the queue, because she has this situation going on. So it's that, that relationship, it's that work that's going on behind the scene that we're able to do with our clergy liaison. So I don't know if I answered the question correctly, but those are the things that we're doing. And, I, and I'm going to bring up one more thing, just to